Born in 1975, Mohammed Ghulam Dewji is a Tanzanian entrepreneur, philanthropist and former politician. Ahlul Bayt TV visited Mohammed at his office in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania to get an exclusive insight into the man recognized as Forbes' 10 most powerful men in Africa and Africa's Person of the Year 2015. Mohammed thank you for joining us can you tell us about your background where you were born did the place where you grew up have any influence on who you are today so i was born uh, in a small town in central tanzania uh, called singida so we are originally indians uh, but you're talking about 100 years ago our great grandparents migrated from india set on dows to look for better pastures and uh, they ended up in africa and then went inland so i was born in singida uh, in 1975 uh, i'm one out of six in the family my sister sabira and then it's me mohammed ali hasan hussein and fatima um the place uh, didn't have much influence then on me because i was very young and left when i was 3 from singida because the education system wasn't very good then so i moved to arusha Uh, and then i continued with my education so in arusha i did my primary education from first grade to seventh grade uh, then moved to dar es salaam uh, i joined the international school of tanganyika this is where i did my o levels uh, this is a school where all diplomats kids go and foreign students come so so it was a, it was a great time i had and then i went did part of my high school in florida uh, in orlando and senior year uh, in tampa then i got into university i went to georgetown university i majored in finance and international business and i minored in theology religion mm-hmm. yes okay. so i graduated in 1998 and then uh, worked at wall street for a little while and then headed back uh, to tanzania to join the family business what difference did you see in culture and community when you moved from one place to another It was it was of course people were very very different uh, Singida being a very very small town coming to Arusha was more of a cosmopolitan uh, so I met it many many new friends uh, came across different cultures when I came to international school I met a lot of american kids european kids asian kids and that gives you a lot of exposure you understand people's cultures and where they are from and uh, it was a very it was a learning journey for me What kind of a child were you? I was a very naughty child. Um uh, I was always avoiding to you know to go to classes. Uh, I was lazy. Um uh, so I was a little intelligent in 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 that way so I was getting away by not studying as hard. So I would describe myself as being a very very naughty naughty child. Yes. Were you a bright student? Uh now that I think back maybe I was uh because I was getting away by not studying um and the funny part was I mean I would go to classes and not take notes mm-hmm. and during that time you know we never had photocopies you know uh, so when the exams would come near and I had uh, friends who I helped out in many other areas in social areas and if they got bullied I would always defend them so when time came I would ask them to copy their notes uh into into a new book and then I would read and I was doing I was a like top 10 student in a class of 30 35 so considering I wasn't studying uh I think I did quite well Muhammad tell us things that most people do not know about you Okay so one thing that people do not know that I went through a really tough time during my primary education where when I would do things wrong my teachers used to hit me now looking back I don't know whether it was legal or not uh but uh, I didn't care much because a lot of us who who were not doing the right things were getting beaten by our, our teachers so I got a lot of punishment that's number one that I've never spoken about uh maybe it's reflected uh well in my life but two i tried to climb mount kilimanjaro and i failed to get to the top um so my guide was saying since we were the first you know it's like oh but i can get you a certification that you have reached the top of mount kilimanjaro but i said but i didn't get there you know um so that was number two and number three that i was born at home on a table so out of my whole family uh, i was the only one that never made it to the hospital 
My, my mom had an 18-hour uh, labor. Uh, I had an umbilical cord that surrounded my neck, and I was born with a midwife and a doctor at home, which was quite dangerous. So these are the things that, that, that people really don't know about me. What is the importance of education in today's day and age? I think education is the key uh, to life. You know, when I go to Georgetown, and this is one of the top institutions in the world, that's when I realized that I was competing with the best and that I needed to put effort. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need to have a right attitude towards education. I yeah. think education will give you a path to success in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I would urge the youth that, that never, never, never give up and always work very hard to educate yourself. And education is, is a process that never ends. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still read a lot and, 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 and educate myself on a daily basis. What did you enjoy doing as a child? I used to enjoy playing sports, uh, like every child. And uh, those days we didn't have too many computers, so there was a lot of outdoor sports. Uh, I used to be a big football player. Um, I used to break my legs very often, but uh, I used to be uh, captaining my team. I used to be a striker. Uh, and that was my passion. So my grandmother, my late grandmother then, she, she, she was a very religious lady. Uh, and a lady very firm in her thought and always knew what she wanted for me. Uh, and in a way, she molded my life. And so when she got complaints from whether it was madrasa or whether it was from school, where I was bunking classes or not studying hard enough, she would not let me go play football. Mm. Uh, so that uh, was always bringing me back to the line, you know. So, so I, as, as a young boy, I'd like to, you know, be more outdoors, mm -hmm. uh, climbing trees and, and playing football. Were there any particular sports you enjoyed playing? Yes, later on I, I got into golf. Um, I became a scratch handicap golfer. Uh, I went to a school called Saddlebrook, Arnold Palmer Golf Academy, where we played golf for six hours. We won the districts in Florida and the states. And when we go to the nationals, I played with this girl who was hitting the ball much longer than me and much more straighter than me. Then I realized that I wasn't going to be a golf professional. So there was a time when I actually, I got scholarships to universities to play golf. Uh, my whole family, if you come to our house, we have almost 200 trophies. So either my brother or my sister was a golfer or was a tennis player. So I went to school with Jennifer Capriati, then she was the Wimbledon champion, and we were voted the most accomplished then at senior year. Now, of course, she was a Wimbledon champion and I was a mere class president. Mm. But, but yes, sports has been a big part of my life and I think sports is very important. It brings discipline, it creates a sense of competition, you know, and, and, and it, it, you, know, you keep away from wrong things by going out uh, uh, to, to, to areas where, where, where you could possibly get negative influence uh, if, if you're doing sports. Who did you look up to in life when growing up? So, of course, all along I've looked up to my father. Uh, my father in a way, and my mother in a way. My father uh, is a very, very strong character. Uh, he has trained me ever since I was young. He took me to China when I was 12 years old. He's trained me to be a businessman all along. Uh, when I used to come back my holidays, he would never let me out to go and, and meet my friends or play. You know, he always used to say, look, their parents are dentists or doctors, but your father is a businessman. So he molded me. Uh, he's a man who has done unbelievably well for himself. Uh, and I look up to him. He, today I am what I am because of him uh, on the business side. Mm -hmm. On my personality side, I would give uh, a lot of credit to my mother, uh, a very calm woman, uh, very nice woman. Uh, a very giving woman, uh, and, and when I look back and think about philanthropy and giving back to community, then I always reflect myself on my mother, notwithstanding that my grandmother has also played a big role uh, in my life in moulding me. Tell us about your siblings. There's a lot of respect between us. Uh, I love them. Uh, there's an age gap between me and my younger brothers. Of course, my sisters are married. Um, so the sense of, you know, a teacher and a student. Mm -hmm. uh, but we walk shoulder to shoulder, you know, and, uh, and they, they support me. 
and uh, I really, really love them. How was it like growing up with six brothers and sisters in the family? See, the problem was that we never grew up together. We grew up in pairs. So I grew up with my sister and then uh, Ali was kind of alone uh, because uh, the age difference. And then Hassan and Hussein grew up together and my youngest sister was also quite alone. So, so I didn't spend much time with them uh, when we were young. But as we grew up, we, we grew much, much closer. You spoke about your father molding you as a businessman. How and when did you start doing business? So I got back in 1999. MTL Group then was a trading house. Today, we're still the largest trading house in uh, East and Central Africa. When I say trading, we talk about the import-export business, soft commodities, sugar, rice, fertilizer that we import. We import everything from air conditioners to bubble gum to yeast to tomato paste to padlocks everything from tractors to bicycles. So we have 300 different products that we import and sell in Tanzania. We're exporters of cash crops, cocoa beans, coffee, sesame seeds, pigeon peas, yellow gram, gum arabica, beeswax. So anything that you find, cotton, sisal, in Tanzania, we buy and we export. So that's one silo. Then we got into manufacturing. Now we have 31 industries, everything from edible oil, cooking fat, margarines to soap, toilet soap, hotel soaps, mm. to detergents. We're into grain milling, wheat milling, maize milling, rice milling. We're into plastics. Now we're competing with Coke and Pepsi with more cola. We're into water, we're into juices. So we've managed to corner the Unilevers and the Procter & Gamble's of this world in oils and soap. Mm. But we're into textiles. We produce 120 million meters of cloth a year. This is three times the circumference of the world. We do ginning, spinning, weaving, processing, mercerizing, dyeing and printing. And now we've gone into knitting and garmenting. So all in all, then we're into agriculture, then we're into mobile telephony, we're into, we have a distribution that nobody has, 120 outlets, 2,000 vehicles, ICT, infrastructure, warehousing. Um, we're into insurance business. So all in all today, this year we're projecting to do one and a half billion dollars of revenue. Uh, we contribute 3.5% of the GDP of Tanzania, but we are very proud that we employ 24,000 people. This is 5% formal employment in Tanzania, and now we're in many countries around. So we're in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, we're in Eastern Congo, South Sudan, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and Ethiopia. And actually next week I'm going to go to Madagascar to try to see if there's opportunities there. Is there any industry you're not into? We're not into hotel business because, again, it's interrelated to, to, to trying to sell alcohol. So these are industries that we avoid because of our religious beliefs. What did it take to get to where you are today? You know, it, 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 you know nothing comes easy in life. Huh? You have to really, really work hard. Uh, so, of course, I believe you need to be very committed in what you want. Then you need to have discipline, you know, then you need to work on a transparency and an ethical way to be able to succeed. So I feel these are the, 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 the characteristics that have made me where I am today. Credibility, when you say something or when you deal with the bank or when you make a commitment, you have to stand by to it. Then whether you're making money or you're losing money. And it's like our religion in Islam, you know, when you give your word, before you even sign a contract, your word is your word. So I think that these are the, the, the areas where, when I reflect back, that these are the principles, fundamentals that I've stood by that have got me where I am today, with the grace of God. How would you define success? What is success? So, you know, success is a, is a, is a very uh, subjective word, you know. Uh, for someone who says that, you know, who drives a nice car, uh, believes that he has achieved that success. For the other, success means that he has to have a private jet to fly around the world and have a yacht. For me, success is contentment, you know? You need to look back at yourself and you need to be content. Uh, and once, the moment you, you stop being content, I believe that, that, that now you are, you know, uh, totally divulging from the success. So for me, success is contentment. Mm -hmm. yes. Tell us about your daily routine. Yeah, so I wake up in the morning, with God's grace, I, I, I wake up for prayers. Uh, and after I pray, um, I 
come to the office because this is where my, my brain is the sharpest. It's early in the morning and I come in, depends 5.30, 6 o'clock. Uh, but when I get here, I shut myself off for one and a half hours where I go through my 700, 800 emails, which include a lot of reports because I'm into many, many commodities, whether it may be sugar, palm oil, wheat, cotton. So there's a lot of reports, a lot of internal emails, a lot of external emails that I respond to. Come 7.30, shut my computer, I have 61 divisional board meetings to run in a month. So we sit down and run these board meetings up till 1, uh, where you go through the cash flows and the profit and loss, and you talk about strategy, whether it may be internal audit or marketing and so forth. Uh, at quarter to one, one, I, this is where my energy levels start dropping because I'm almost in the office for eight hours. Uh, so I head to the gym mm -hmm. um, regularly, six times a week. I run three kilometers a day, you know, uh, and I go and do weights. Uh, one hour, but it's very, very intense. By the time I get out at two, I stop by home, have my lunch, get to see my kids for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then I head back to the office for the second day. This is where now I do a lot of strategy, I do a lot of meetings uh, with the consultants, with the auditors, with external people, with government, and so forth and so on. And then in the evenings, I have a lot of guests, uh, whether they may be bankers or investors or you know, people who I do business with, uh, or I'm invited to a reception by an embassy. You know, So I always end up going, uh, 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 out later after 7, uh, uh, otherwise I'm in the office and I get home by 8.30, 9 o'clock uh, and I have my dinner. By that time I've done my prayers and I try to sleep uh, early, which sometimes is very difficult when your brain is just, you know, moving at a very fast rate, you know. Yes. What drives you and motivates you in life? You see, what drives me is creation of wealth is one, but of course you know, it's just not about creation of wealth, you know, because there's so many, you know, Mercedes Benz you can buy and so many suits you can, uh, you can buy. It's about giving back to the community. Uh, so me and my wife, we've opened a Modeoji Foundation where I've pledged a uh, million dollars uh, in it. And hopefully with, with God's will, I want to put it up to about $10 million. And I want to create an endowment where, you know, this money is going to generate itself and that that money is going to go into helping causes, whether it be healthcare or education and so forth. Mm -hmm. So me and my wife are working very closely. She's also working very closely with children with cancer uh, that's close to her. Uh, so, so, so the more wealth you, you generate, uh, and the more you have to redistribute this wealth to the underprivileged and to those that, that have no access to straight things in life. Can you tell us more about the Modelji Foundation? Okay, so, so I've been doing a lot of CSR, um, uh, a lot of development work, but without a formal institution. So we, I've just started this maybe three months ago. Uh, so within three months, I have already put in that $1 million. Mm -hmm. So now we are formalizing the institution and we're going to form a board and we've got a CEO that's going to run this. Uh, Tell us more about your routine. For how long do you see yourself working this hard? Do you have time for holidays and family? So in the past, you know, I used to work uh, every day of my life. Um, and I used to work till midnight. Uh, but of course, uh, with my wife, uh, getting married to my wife, my wife actually was a Hindu. Um, she converted to become uh, a Muslim. And she's a great Muslim. I think she keeps me in check with uh, many things uh, as far as religion is concerned, uh, discipline of going to the mosque and prayers and so forth and so on. She's done a wonderful job. She studied the Quran. Um, she teaches my kids Islamic history. Uh, so she's playing a big, big role uh, in my life in terms of taking care of my children. I have three kids. I have a daughter that's 11, her name is Naila, then my son Abbas is 8, and then my youngest one is 4, his name is Mahdi. Um, so so, so she, she puts a lot of sense in me. Uh, so I used to work on Sundays, now I don't. So it's, it's Dad's day, I mean I would take out my kids from morning to evening. 
Um, I'm working lesser hours, for sure. And I think with time to come, I think that, that I'm going to keep on reducing the hours I work and try to you know, focus more on philanthropy, try to focus more on, on, on you know, developing my kids' character you know, and giving them a, you know, um, a direction in life. Yeah, for sure, it's not going to go on already from the time I joined the business to when I reflect now. It's definitely the hours are getting lesser and lesser. What advice can you give to those who look up to you as a businessman? as a person, and those who aspire to be like you? You know, I, I, I can again come back to them. First, I want to tell them, whether it's Africa, Africa has a huge potential. One, Tanzania has an even bigger potential. I mean, if you look at the six out of the 10 fastest growing economies are in Africa, in the world. I mean, the world economists, I read, say that the world economy is growing at 1.7, 1.8%. The African continent is growing at 4.8% and Tanzania is growing at 7%. So wherever you touch, there is money. So you are in the right time at the right place. That's one thing. Two, you need to be highly disciplined. You know, uh, you cannot have success without working hard. And success or becoming wealthy is not about, you know, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a block by block process. Uh, it's like, you know, climbing the stairs. There's no taking an elevator in this process. So I, 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 I would urge the youth to, to, to be very patient, to be very ethical, you know, to work very hard. And uh, with God's will, you know, I think that the success lies ahead of them. Why did you get into politics and when? So, so I go back from uh, university, uh, 98 I graduated, I go back in 99. So obviously I wanted to go back to Singida, uh, where to see where I was from, because my grandfather is buried there, my great-grandfather is buried there, my great-great-grandmother is buried there. So I went there um, just to realize and to see how much poverty there was. And I met an old man and he was kneeling down and there was a puddle of yellow water and there was a bucket and there was a plate. He kept on taking the plate and scooping that water and sand would come in. This is yellow water, and he would put it into the bucket. And I would say, you know, how are you, sir? What are you doing? He's like, this is the water I'm drinking, and this is the water my family is drinking. So, I, you know, from the US, I was like, you know what, I don't believe you, you know? So he's like, no problem, you come to my home. You know, I went to his house, I saw young kids drinking yellow water put in PET bottles. Then I started doing some research on infant deaths, on waterborne disease. By the time, you know, these people, not only do they have bad water, the education is so poor. So they have, they get sicknesses or waterborne diseases like typhoid, for example. They would start treating them at village level, you know? Um, and then the things would get worse by the time the healthcare centers are so far, by the time the kids go there and get there, half of the kids die. Now, you know, I have children and I love my children and I know every parent loves their child the way I love mine. And you cannot tell me a child in London, you know, his or her life is more, it's worth more than a child in Singida or in Tanzania or an African child. Life equals to life, brother. You follow me? So that, that kind of triggered everything. When I got back to Dar, I told my dad, look, I want to run for parliament. So he actually told me that, oh, why don't you run for parliament? So I was like, who's your MP? He's like, my MP is the minister of water. So this guy's big cabinet, you know, secretary in, in English terminology, you know. And so I got back, I told my dad, my dad's like, look, look, we're business people, you know, don't get involved in this politics and so on and so forth. But I kept on saying, no, no, I think I can make a difference. You know, I can increase accessibility of water. So he's like, uh, you know, you, you're a popular guy because I was sponsoring Simba Sports Club. This is like the men, you the Liverpool or the Arsenal of, of, of Tanzania. And at that time, we were doing very, very well. Uh, I would walk into the streets and people would know this is more, you know. So he's like, why don't you run in Dar es Salaam, you know, a constituency in Dar es Salaam because we have business here. Uh, this is a commercial capital. I was like, no, I want to be the MP for Singida. So in 2000, 90, 
99, I started my political career. I was 24 years old. I went and ran against this man. And at that time, I beat him in the primaries. I got like 94% votes. But my party did not nominate me. They said I was too young to become an MP. So I go back 2000 till 2005. I, I, I did business. And I still was doing a lot of development work in Singida, but not as an MP, just a, as a normal Singida citizen. 2005, I went back. I, I won the nomination this time, became an MP. So let me give you some statistics. So there were two secondary schools. This is all of us. When I became an MP, today we have 18 secondary schools. We've built 16 schools, brand new schools. Um, I give scholarships to half of the kids that go to school in, in Singida. Water, you know, my constituency is a peri-urban constituency. So it's, it's urban, but then the periphery are rural. So urban, we got this huge grant from, the, from OPEC uh, and Badea. We did a $35 million project through the government. The accessibility of water in, this, in the town, in municipality, is perfect now. In the rural areas where the problem was, this is a very dry area. You need to do bore wells. The accessibility of water was 23%. With God's will today, we spent millions of dollars of personal money. To, to, to complement the government, and now the accessibility is 83%. Healthcare, we're fighting cataract, HIV, malaria, uh, we're making big strides. So, to answer your question, what took me there was development of the people, of Singida. What are some of the challenges you face and foresee in politics? See, politics is very difficult because, uh, first, that you know, uh, you have many, many people, you have many, many voters, and everyone has their own acumen. You know, uh, what you see that look that that the resource is is a limited. Resources are limited, and you have to make sure that you spend the resources the highest impactful way. So, what you see is not what they see. Uh, they look at it in the whole like very individualistic way. Uh, so th that kind of creates a problem because then, then you know, your popularity would fall. Uh, so I guess that, that, that would be a major problem. Yeah. What have you learned during your time as an MP in Tanzania? I've learned a lot about our country. I've learned that our country is very poor uh, and that, that we have a responsibility as leaders uh, to work day and night to make sure that how do we alleviate this poverty? How do we bring people who earn very little to a better life? Simple things, you know. Politics has taught me to touch the poor. I think if I wasn't a politician, I would have not known uh, the levels of poverty or the, the levels of problems that are there, not only in Tanzania, but in Africa. Mm -hmm. When I go there, I actually see I see people that do not have proper clothing. I see people who have problems in healthcare. I see people that, you know, are worried to do a cataract operation and are really willing to sacrifice their eyes because of their poor education. That is what politics has taught. Politics has taught me to be grounded on the floor. How do you find the time to adjust between politics and business? So I, I, I spend 90% of my time running my business. Um, I don't go to the parliament as much as I should. Uh, I don't go to my constituency as much as I should. And uh, when I was uh, going for re-election in 2010, there was a lot of questions asked that day. What kind of MP are you? You, know, you never represent us in the parliament, or you're not much here. But you know, I... I, I um, I, I still won with a big mandate. I think I won by like 84, 85 uh, percent. Now that gives you a clear sign that, that whether I'm there or not, the development is happening. I tell them that today, the money that I'm spending and complementing the government is, the money, is, is more money than any MP is spending in Tanzania because I have a business. So if I focus on the business, I generate more wealth. If I generate more wealth, then I take this wealth and spend more money in development. 
And I think they've understood that, you know. I think they've understood that, 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 that they know that their MP is not going to parliament and they've accepted it totally. Yes. What vision do you foresee for Tanzania and for Africa? Okay, so for Tanzania, first, if you look at it, we're the gateway to East and Central Africa. We have eight countries that surround us. This is a huge country. This is four times the, the size of the United Kingdom. I mean, this is one million, almost one million square kilometer of land. We have abandoned uh, resources, natural resources. You talk about coal, you talk about magnesium, you talk about uh, steel, you talk about Tanzanites. You know, this is a precious stone that's not found anywhere in the world. You talk about tourism, Zanzibar, Serengeti, Manyara, you know, Kilimanjaro, you know. Um, now we've just hit gas. We've hit, I think, now 55 trillion cubic feet of gas in the south. I mean, this is huge. I mean, our country's been growing at 7% over the last 10 years. Our currency is quite, you know, stable in terms of it's not devaluing against US dollar major currencies. Our inflation is about six, six and a half percent. I think uh, we have a few challenges. Our challenge is infrastructure, port, rail possibly. Our challenge is power, you know. Uh, but once we have this gas coming in, I think uh, all these challenges are going to be overcome mm -hmm. and uh, we should be growing at 10%. So I'm very, very bullish about Tanzania and we have huge land in terms of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So we have the capacity to be able to feed Africa. And I think Africa is the next frontier. I mean, we have a billion people in this continent. Two thirds are less than like, 30 years old. So this is where the next growth market is going to be. You know, there are fewer failed states, you may call, or you see there are fewer very, you know, uh, countries that are, 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 are involved in wars than 20 years ago. And I think in the next 10 years, I think that uh, if you want to make money, Africa is a place to be. How important is faith to you? Faith is very, very important. I think it's fundamental. I think in anything you do in life, uh, um, it's, it's, it's important because when you pray, it brings you contentment. You don't get anxiety, whatever you do in business, because there's so many uncertainties in the world, whether it may be in politics, whether it may be in business, whether it may be in family. Humans have a nature of worrying. They want to kind of, you know, because they do not know what is coming in the future. So when you have faith, when you're religious, when you pray, you have faith in the Lord, in God. Mm -hmm. So you're ready for anything. What's going to happen is going to happen if God wills. Mm -hmm. What's not going to happen is not going to happen if God wills. Mm -hmm. He knows what is best for me. So that takes a lot of pressure off you as a person in your daily life. As a Shia Muslim, how have the Ahlul Bayt inspired you in where you are today? You know, uh, they've inspired me in many, many ways, uh, but, but one is sacrifice, you know, that these are such saints that have given their lives for the religion. They have given lives mm -hmm. for the betterment of community. Mm -hmm. They have stood by the right and have spoken against the wrong. You know, many a times, many people say, it's not that, you know, you, you know, you, you support the wrong, but many of us don't speak the truth when wrong has been done. And this is an example. I mean, if you study uh, the history of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I've been invited to the United Nations, even the United Nations uh, had said that if you want to govern, uh, then you should emulate Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so, so they, they play a big, big role in my life, in the direction of my life, you know, and how I think through many things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us about an incident when faith has helped you through a tough time or period in life. Yes, um, it, it, it did, you know, I mean, um, when I was campaigning um, in uh, Singida, uh, and you know, this is very vigorous, huh? um, you have, you know, many speeches to, to make, you know, many rallies. Uh, the food is terrible. 
uh, you get really, really, really fatigued. And uh, in the end, in the last two weeks, I was losing my voice. And I was having a lot of pain uh, in my throat. And uh, you know, and I, they were giving me honey and it's gonna come back and so forth and so on. And I was speaking less loudly than I usually do. Um, but then it wasn't going away. You know, my voice was just scratching the whole time. So you know, you sit down these days, you Google things and you know, laryngitis and cancer and you know, and so forth and so on. And suddenly you start thinking, oh my God, you know, what if I have cancer, right? Then I was like, listen, so what is this use of me trying to campaign and becoming an MP and what if I can, you know, go, you know? And so, so, so again, my faith uh, to, to the Lord that look, let me finish this. This is for a good cause. You know, I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for the people. I need to be elected so that I'm in a position to, be, to help them. And then after that, I will go and get checked, you know, whatever it is, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, you know, God, it's, it's, it's what God wants. So I think that one week, uh, it was my faith that kept me afloat uh, to be able to stand up and to continue campaigning. Uh. Media is one of the fastest growing and powerful industries in the world. How important is media, particularly in portraying the correct image of Islam? I think it's very important. I think that, you know, there's a huge distortion of Islam in this world. Uh, <laughs> together with all the distortion, uh, I was looking at a documentary, that Muslims now have outnumbered Catholics in this world. So people are converting still yet to Islam with all this negative uh, media attention that we're having. Mm -hmm. I think it is your responsibility as an Islamic media house to portray our religion correctly. Mm -hmm. To portray and to say there is no, you know, many a times now, people are looking, okay, the Islamic faith is, is, is getting stronger and stronger. So now how do we divide? It's the same, you know, imperialist view of divide and rule. And now there's division coming on Shia and Sunni. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a theology minor. I studied, you know, Islamic thought and practices, Jewish mysticism, Christian ethics, modern Hinduism, and there is no difference between Shia and Sunni. We're one. We're Muslims. We pray five times a day, we fast, we believe in one God, we believe in Muhammad as the prophet. You know, whether someone prays with their hands straight or prays hands, I see no difference. So I think that you, as a media house, one of your fundamental challenges is create an environment so that we do away from this division. Together, we're strong. Our religion, our faith is the same, fundamentally. Aside from portraying the correct image of Islam and in uniting the Muslim community, what else should an Islamic TV channel like Ahlul Bayt TV aspire to do? I, I think that, yes, I think Islamic education is important. I think Quran is important. I think Islamic history is important. This is important pillars of Islam, of course. You know? But together with that, you know, you need to prepare the youth, education, entrepreneurship, business, politics. You know, you cannot just stick to just uh, one side of the coin, but rather try to cover many, many areas of, of, of life itself. We talk about science, we talk about mathematics. You know, get people interested. You know, it should not be just that, oh, when I turn on this channel, it's only going to be about religion. It's only going to be about faith. I think that's important. But, you know, you should curb it to, you know, 10%, 15% of the time. The rest, 85%, should be, have a full spectrum in the last mile on everything else. I thank you and uh, I'm honored. Thank you so you know, much. We appreciate it and God bless you. And if there's anything we can do, please tell us. Absolutely. Thank you.